So um, I think the place to start tonight is just get a bit of your backstory, both of you. Um, why don't we start with you, Hemant? Um, so yeah, uh, about 10 years ago, you published a book called um, I Sold My Soul on eBay. Tell yeah. us the story of Which that. Which I didn't actually do, but the, the <laughs> quick version of the story is I had been an atheist for a number of years since, since high school. This is a little after college. Uh, I put up a weird auction on eBay that said, you know, right now I'm, I've been an atheist for a while, but I've never actually gone to a church, like not on purpose, because it's not the religion I grew up in. And I work with a lot of atheists, a lot of whom come from religious backgrounds, all of whom kind of know what they're leaving, and I don't have that same traditional experience. So look, you can bid on where I go to church, and if you win, the money will be donated, but I'll go to where you want me to go. <laughs> and that backfired because a pastor won for $500. Wow. And I owed him a year of church. Wow, that was cheap. <laughs> he got you cheap. Yeah, yeah. he really did. Um, and we made a deal where he's like, look, he actually knew the landscape better than I did, the Christian landscape. I didn't. He's like, well, I'm from Chicago. He said, let me pick like 10 churches in Chicago. We'll send you to, you know, the evangelical mega church and a church on the south side of Chicago and a, a church that's in some guy's living room because they just got started. That way you can experience the different flavors of it. And I want you to report back to my ministry. Right. We'll call that a deal. I'm like, that's better than... 50 weeks of church, <laughs> fine. And I had a chance to go to more churches to write mm. that book, which mm. they called I Sold My Soul on eBay because they said it was catchy, <laughs> which I agree with. <laughs> but right, so I did that for, yeah. um, after that experiment kind of ended, mm. one of the cool things to come from that is I had written about my church-going experiences, what I liked, what I didn't like, on this guy's ministry's website. And the conversations that flowed, I mean, if you've seen an internet comment thread, you know what that's going to be like. <laughs> but these were really interesting conversations where you had Christians and atheists chiming in saying, I did like that part of church. I did not like this other part. Very civil dialogue. It was fun. Right. And I just wanted to keep that going. So I started uh, FriendlyAtheist.com. And since then, it's kind of morphed into more of a news, politics, current events yeah. sort of thing, as opposed to here's why I'm right, here's why you're wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's kind of what I've been doing for the past there several years. Fascinating stuff. We're going to obviously dig into what you mean by atheism and that kind of thing as we get into the discussion tonight. A uh, quick introduction to you as well, though, Sean. Um, this isn't the first time we've shared a stage together. We did something not dissimilar to this two years right. ago with Ryan Bell down in California. But um, just remind us again, for those who aren't familiar with you, a little of your background, your story, um, what it was, wh wh why you're a Christian uh, right now and, and whether sure. that's always been the case. Grew up in a Christian home, which is no surprise if you recognize my father's name, Josh McDowell. He's been writing, speaking. He's turned 79 uh, this month. And, uh, it's worth an you. applause, yes. As energetic, driven as ever. So grew up with parents, passionate about the faith, taught me the faith that made sense, believed it. Hit a point where I was like, yeah, I don't know that I believe this anymore. Walked away from the Lord. Experienced the pain and the hurt of this. I was at the end of my rope. Couldn't go any further. So when I was four years old, I got down <laughs> on my knees. <laughs> I'm glad you catch my sarcasm and joke. You know, honestly, growing up in the church, one of the things you probably saw this visiting church is like you hear these amazing testimonies like, man, God, this uses this person out of prison and out of a gang. I'm like, if God's going to use me, I got to go to prison or gang. And it didn't really occur to me. I didn't want to. <laughs> so it never really had a dramatic story. I mean, be honest, like I believed it. It made sense. I probably would have told you somebody wasn't a Christian because they just haven't read like evidence that demands verdict. And then all of a sudden I get to college is like mid nineties and the secular web is kind of starting people that you, you know, well, and I got in there and I'm reading these philosophers and historians and scientists who kind of started part of the secular web going chapter by chapter through my dad's book. <laughs> and it was really unsettling. I thought, man, I know my parents mean well, I don't know how to answer this. And it was unsettling intellectually more so emotionally and we were in Breckenridge, Colorado. I think I was 19, 20, about my sophomore year. And I went with, with my dad. I said, Dad, can we get some coffee? I just, I got to tell you what I think. And we sat down. I said, something to the effect, as best I can remember it, Dad, I want to know what's true, but I'm not sure I'm convinced Christianity's really true. 
I mean, if you're a Christian parent or grandparent and your kid said that to you, imagine how you might respond. I kid you not, my dad, it's like he didn't even take a breath. He looks at me, he goes, son, I think that's great. And I said, like, did you hear? <laughs> like, I'm not sure I buy this faith. I don't know, I have questions. I wanna follow truth, I don't know if it's true. And he looked at me, he goes, son, you can't live on my faith. You've gotta know for yourself what you think is true. And he did say, he goes, I think if you really follow truth, you will be led to Jesus because Jesus is the truth. But you have to figure that out and know that your mom and I love you no matter what. And I read, I read your book, The Young Atheist Survival Guide. Did I get that yeah, right? Yeah. And you talked about how so many times kids in Christian homes feel like if they doubt, it's like, you didn't use the word sin, but the worst thing you can do, they feel guilty, they feel terrible. And you posed in there, you said, what if every parent just said, I'm disappointed that you believe differently, but I love you. I thought that was powerful. That's essential. That's exactly what my dad said to me. I don't think I stopped believing. And to be honest with you, in the history of my life, I don't want to over-dramatize like that experience, but it was very formative. It was very freeing for me. And it took some time to just reading different religious texts, reading popular atheist Christians, trying to say, does this make sense? And why do I believe it? Bottom line is I'm a Christian because I think it's true. And I'm captivated by this person, Jesus. I really am. And I fail to live out what he asks every day of my life to different degrees. But I think he diagnosed the human condition. And I think he lived the most exemplary life ever. So I'm a Christian because I believe in Jesus, which is probably what you'd expect me to say. But it's, it's true. That's, that's where I'm at. So... And, and now I want to hear how, how Richard Dawkins led you to atheism. Um, no, I'm, I'm only joking. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 what, I mean, that was, that was great to hear kind of the, the, how, how that journey took place for you, Sean. But Hemant, when you, do you ever actually kind of present yourself to people as an atheist? Is that a badge you're happy to wear? Is, what, 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 and what do you mean by it when you, when you say it? Well, one, it depends who I'm talking to. Mm-hmm. It's not the Fair first enough. thing I'm going to introduce myself as when I meet somebody. <laughs> uh, it's not something I necessarily advertise. I, I know atheists who are proud to, I'll go to the airport tomorrow. I'm wearing my, there's no God, whatever shirt. Um, I, no, I'm wearing this. I, I'm not telling you anything. <laughs> but um, for, for me, it's, I hear the evidence people are presenting. I don't believe it. That's it. It's not a definitive, no, God doesn't, and I'll prove it to you. Mm. It's a, I've heard your evidence, I don't believe it, the world makes complete sense when I don't believe it, mm. um, so that makes the most sense to me. Yeah. Uh, that's not, to me, agnostic, by the way. Okay. That is atheist. I don't believe that there's evidence for God's existence. Some people have kind of um, distinguished between saying, uh, I believe there's no God, and, well, I simply lack belief in God. Do you kind of go down that kind of route at all? Is that helpful in any way, defining no, atheism like that? it's not helpful for me because okay. the conversations I tend to have with people don't break it down into these philosophical nuances. Yeah. So just to keep it simple, no, I don't believe that stuff. That's yeah. my definition for you. Yeah. It, yeah. It's the simplest one I can probably give to a random person I'm talking to. Do, do you feel like you're open to believing if you had, I don't know, the right kind of evidence in front of you, that sort of thing? Yes, and mm. I think every atheist would say the exact same thing. Of course, we're open to it. That's the whole point. Mm. This isn't a dogmatic belief. Sure. That's the other side. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. That's... <laughs> well. <laughs> of course, I'm open to hearing it. And by the way, I, I'm not just saying that to, to get a laugh, but I have heard Christians ask the similar question. Sure. You know, if I showed you evidence mm. that mm. you were wrong about mm. your beliefs, mm. would sure. you change it? And they will say no. No, I believe this stuff is 100% true. Wh wh and whatever the evidence, will, right. Nothing will wh change my wh mind. What would you say to that question yourself, Sean, if I you guess were asked my, it? I guess my question would be is, are you saying our side's do more dogmatic than like Dawkins is? Because yes. Dawkins <laughs> and Dennett seems about as dogmatic as you can get. I think you're wrong. Tell me why. I'm yeah, interested um, to hear. I, I think Dawkins would say the same thing I just answered you, not to speak for him, but to say, no, show me the evidence. I think he gets more attention, and he, the people want to hear what he has to say a lot more, so he comes across in a lot of ways that I don't... It's not the way I would answer a lot of mm, questions, mm. so I think it's kind of easy to perceive him to be dogmatic, but I think if you ask him straight up, look, we have proof God exists, we have proof Jesus is, that, is the route... To, to get there and stuff, he would, he would hear it. I think he's heard it enough. 
I mm. think there's no uh, version of your story or any Christian story sure. that he hasn't heard before. So it's like, it, I, I'm sure if you're like, let me tell you my testimonial and let me see if I can change your mind. I'm sure his reaction would be like, oh God, not this again. <laughs> but what, I, I don't understand why that makes him more dogmatic than no, William I think Lane because I, think I know a lot of these people and they, they would tell me they're very open. Yeah. They try to characterize the other side fairly would fall the evidence where it leads. I mean, one of the leading Christian scholars on the resurrection, Lacona, is more committed to falling truth wherever it leads. So much in his research on the resurrection, he's like, there's a season I didn't believe because I was absolutely committed to fall wherever truth leads. Like, that doesn't strike me as more dogmatic than no, that's, Dawkins that's and not to you, pick on him. No, 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 and it's not about him too. I think it's that idea that I think they're open to evidence, but when you've been doing the stuff that you do, that I do, for as long as those guys have, it's kind of like there's nothing new you're bringing my way. And sure. so, yeah, I think I'm right about this, and I don't think there's a lot that's going to change my mind, okay. but I'm open to it. So, so tell me why I'm wrong about this. I think there's dogmatic atheists, and I think there's dogmatic Christians. I think it's a human tendency, whatever your belief is, to be entrenched and not consider evidence the contrary. I don't, to me, I don't think it's uniquely a Christian thing. No, I'm not saying I think it's, it's uniquely a human Christian. thing. I, I agree with you on that. I, th I think when I see online, when I see people talking about atheists or calling them dogmatic or inflexible with their beliefs, it's, it's really mischaracterizing them in the sense that, no, I think they're open to it. I think the evidence you're presenting them is just really bad. Okay. That's why well, they're not listening well, to what you have to we're, say. We're going to come to the evidence yeah. and talk about that yeah, side of fair. things. Um, when, when it comes to the blog you run, the Friendly Atheist blog, it's a popular blog on the Pathios Network, uh, Hemant, um, you call it the friendly atheist, though you're not afraid of being quite sort of forthright, um, even, you know, quite critical, obviously, of, of certain aspects of Christianity. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've said this before, which is that it's not because I'm friendly and the other atheists are not. <laughs> it's because most atheists I know are pretty nice. Yeah. But every time I read about them, whether it's a book mm. from a Christian apologist mm. Or written about in the media, mainstream media too. It's like it's an angry atheist, aggressive okay. atheist, militant, staunch. I right. could give you a so long you, list you of adjectives. So you feel atheists get a kind of a bad rap. Oh in, yeah, in that I'm going to make you say friendly in front of the word, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Well, that sounded kind of dogmatic. To you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing. Like you're but, sounding very militant, but now, it doesn't mean you can't be critical about uh, what you're seeing. Sure. I mean, what what do you think? I mean, I guess we're going into the territory which the, uh, the, 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 the conference tomorrow will be covering about how we have the conversations between Christians and non-Christian skeptics and so on. Do you, do you find that um, atheists get misrepresented or do you find it's more Christians get misrepresented by atheists? What, what's your view on that? Oh, Sean? gosh, that's hard. Uh, you know what? I, th I think it goes both ways. I do. I, I read your book carefully, Young Atheist Survival Guide and the other one, and it gave me a lot of sympathy and compassion trying to step inside an atheist, looking at court cases, the way people describe them, the drawings that you had in there, we could talk about that. And I walked away, I'm like, wow, I don't think I realized the degree to which atheists feel misrepresented. And probably people on the religious side have done this either consciously or unconsciously. I do feel the same way though, regularly, from atheists and my beliefs. I get tweeted all the time, like, we well, just believe this and you're that way. I'm like, actually, I'm not. Now, I don't know if that's most or just the vocal ones, mm -hmm. but I think there's just, I think there's a breakdown in communication. There's not a willingness to listen. There's not a willingness to be charitable to the other side. There's not a willingness to let people speak for themselves and try to be understood on their own terms. So I don't know that it's uniquely Christians or atheists. There's more Christians than atheists, so I, I, probably I think in numbers it happens it, more. It's probably but. true that both sides are sometimes guilty of yeah. cherry-picking the worst examples of the other side, if you like, and, and holding them up as somehow the, the norm. If I may add sure. to that, yes, I don't think you're wrong about that. But a lot of the atheists that I've, I've talked to and worked with, they've been on the other side. Mm. They know what... They know what regular Christians, they know what their family is like mm. when they, mm. they are Christians. They know what mm. the good ones are like. <laughs> they also know that the loud ones that tend to get the most attention are not necessarily representative of everybody, mm. but they've been in those shoes before. Mm. So when they're critiquing, sometimes unfairly, for mm. sure, uh, it's coming from a place where they know what they're talking about in some aspects. Sure. Not all of them. And yeah. I don't, but I can't necessarily the same, say the same thing about religious people that they have all been where I'm at 
and then made the same jump sure. to accepting yeah. Christ later in life or something. So I think we're coming, most of the atheists I know are coming from a place where they've been there, which is why they could speak about it. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to the conversation tonight. And I just want to say a, a special thank you as well, Hemant, for coming and um, uh, here to Westside and Sean as well, because I think what you guys are doing is demonstrating that we can have good conversations, even though we sincerely disagree about our different worldviews. And I'm sure that'll come out as we get through uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, we're doing something uh, quite exciting this evening in, in the course of the rest of the dialogue. What I've asked Hemant and Sean to do is both come up with two things that they think the other side misconceives about their position. So for Hemant, it's two things that he thinks Christians often get wrong about atheists. And for Sean, it's two things that he thinks atheists often get wrong about Christianity. And so these guys haven't shared those with each other. I know what they are. But this will be, be fresh <laughs> from these two. Uh, and so, so I'm looking forward to this. So why don't we let Hemant, you go first, with your, your first thing that you think is often a misconception when it comes to atheism. I've heard so many times people say that atheists don't believe in God or because they hate God or because they had some bad experience with God or with other believers, which I, it, it comes, I know they don't mean it this way, but it comes across as an insult every time I hear that because it suggests that like my atheism is the result of a trauma or okay. something, that I never put any thought into it that I never asked the questions, that I never did the sort of research and digging into it, like Sean was saying he did. Um, because you're, you're just an atheist because you're in rebellion against God. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. You're just that, rebelling that kind of against a... your parents, your culture, yeah. whatever okay. it is. And it's like, no, 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 I studied this stuff. This is the conclusion I arrived at. It's not like something that happened to me. It's something I actively sought out, and this mm. is where I ended up at. So it, it bothers me when someone says, you hate God, you only have met bad, bad Christians. Once, let, here's the book you need to read. Here's okay. the Christian you need to talk to or listen to. Have they heard of my then... book, by the way? I was just, no. Uh, but, but yeah, but, just, yeah this I get Im what you're saying. This it's... implying that we haven't put any thought into it. Sure. Okay, so, Sean, um, essentially, when Christians say, oh, you're just an atheist because you, you know, you've, you, you had a bad experience of church or you've rebelled against God or you're, Basically, it's not because of the evidence, it's because you don't like it for some reason. What, what do you say to that? I, I think this is interesting you brought it up. I was curious which one you were going to bring up. And I think what happens is we, we attribute psychological motivations for somebody. You hate your father. And on the other side, they say, well, you need a heavenly father. Like, I think it can go both ways. We just need comfort. You need to believe in this so you believe in God. Well, neither of those show whether it's true or it's right. It's just talking about our motivations. Yeah. So I think, I think those games can go both ways, at least in my experience, although this is a common one. I, I'm curious, do you think there's any connection in your mind for some people and motivation, having a bad experience with a father, translating to their earthly father? Do you think there's anything to that? What do you mean by I'm that? sorry, translating their earthly father to the idea of a heavenly father bad experience with a dad here, so I don't want the Heavenly Father in my life. Like, do you, ha do you think there's any credibility to that? I'm not saying for you. Oh, like in general, if someone had a bad experience with their yeah, dad? Yeah, like I'm not trying to say every atheist that's true for yeah. him. But, well, I'll give you an example. Like my, I mean, my dad wasn't an atheist. He was an agnostic, and he was examining the Christian faith, and he said one of the hurdles he had to go through is my grandfather, his dad, was a drunk, and he was very abusive, and when my dad would hear in church this idea of Heavenly Father, he's like, why would I want a father in my life? Why would I want some oh. authority when father means this? Like, it seems to me at least there could be some connection between that. Not for everybody, but I've how do you make sense I've never heard it once that? from atheists that I know. That, that explanation or that sort of thing, that's not to say they didn't have something bad happen in their family, but that sort of... Um, this is what my dad was like, therefore I don't need any dad, that sort of thing. I've never heard that one. I mean, would it be fair to say, if that was going on in any case, it might be only something someone might recognize once they had come back to Christianity or, or to faith or something like that? Because obviously it was something your father said was significant in his, the reason he, he, he was going the that. other direction, and that yeah. was a barrier to him. Yeah. I haven't heard that one, but I mean, I will, if, if, if I can broaden that for a second, if you're saying maybe they have experienced something bad and so they don't want to do anything to do with faith or God or the church or anything like that, 
I think for a lot of people that may be the first domino falling, but it doesn't mean the rest are going to go automatically. It's, it might be the case that, oh, I had a father who did something really horrible, or I went through this traumatic incident, or I met this Christian who did this horrible thing or whatever. Mm. That might get them questioning, mm. but then they're going to follow that up. So it's not the direct reason they're an atheist, but it might be the thing that it might be says, the thing that triggers the, the, the that journey. triggers the rest of yeah. it and says maybe there's something not true with the stuff I believe right now that mm. I need to explore mm. more. What what's, that happens what, more? Sean, often. do you do you find generally with the atheists you interact with that the the reason they are an atheist is is that they genuinely just don't um, have enough intellectual reasons to believe. Or, or do you think very often there is some kind of psychological or emotional reason why they've, uh, they've become an atheist? See, one thing I try to not do is guess people's motivations, to be honest. I don't, I don't know the answer to mm. that. I think whatever we believe, there's a mixture. There's intellect. There's an emotional side. There could be a moral side, a relational side, and they probably balance for different people. And, and for Christians, I, too. I, uh, I imagine the yeah. reason many people are Christians is a, is a mixture of emotion, spiritual experience, evidence. We're all kind of, in a sense, yeah. in the same boat in, in, in the things that bring us to where we are. I, there, there was an interesting study by a psychologist named Paul Witz. He called it the faith of the fatherless. And he studied the great atheists like in history, like Marx, Nietzsche, Camus. I feel like I've heard a version of this. And I, I, I'm not a psychologist, but his argument, he said, is we look at these leading atheists, they all had one thing in common, a dead, distant, or harsh father. And he just asked the question, could there be a connection between how we see our earthly father and view him and import that onto heavenly father and God? Right. That doesn't prove atheism is true or false or Christianity, but I think that's at least an interesting What do you question. make of that And that I know hypothesis. it works in the reverse for different it's, reasons. I, I, remember, I don't remember the guy himself, but I do remember a version of that argument. And I remember thinking, yeah, but they have a ton of things in common. A lot of these guys have been pretty wealthy relative to everyone else in their society. It doesn't mean being rich makes you an atheist. Mm. You know what I mean? You could say a bunch of people had mustaches. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you could find a million commonalities okay. just because they may not have had these ideal relationships. I don't know a lot of people who have perfect relationships with their dad. Yeah. It doesn't mean X, Y, and Z. It, it, that's a good opportunity to move on to Sean. Uh, okay. Would you like to bring your first misconception that you think atheists often get wrong about Christians? I noticed that when you want me to do something, you ask a question. This is like the <laughs> British way of saying... Uh, it's my, my politeness like, do you want through. to go on stage? You're so much more polite than we are for Americans. I'll speak for us. Uh, sure. So here, here's a misconception I think is one of the biggest ones that I hear, is that faith is defined as believing something without evidence. Mm -hmm. Now... I'm not saying there's not Christians who believe things without evidence and blindly. Of course there are. You know them, I know them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying atheists can't use whatever definition of faith that they want to use. Free country, go for it. But the Bible doesn't teach that faith is opposed to or without evidence. So, I mean, I could give a bunch of examples, like Acts 1-3, when the story of the church begins. It says Jesus appeared. In fact, can I just read it? Yeah, sure. Just give a little context. Is that cool? Looks like you um, got it ready. There we go. I am <laughs> ready to go. He, he, he's well, always I, ready, is Sean. Acts, I am. <laughs> Acts 1-3, it says, after he suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. In other words, Jesus didn't say blindly follow me, shows up, does miracles, appears to them. Exodus 14.31, you see a similar pattern. Where interestingly enough, you know the song in, uh, what's the Disney movie, Prince of Egypt, it says miracles happen when you believe. Remember that song? They actually got it backwards. They didn't do miracles because the people believed. They never would have believed. They never would have gotten out of Egypt. Rather, it says, when Israel saw the great power the Lord used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and believed. In other words, God does a miracle, reveals himself, and then the belief follows the miracle. This is the whole point, I think, of the story of the doubting Thomas. It says he did many other proofs so that people would believe. So you might reject the evidence, but I think it's a mischaracterization of a Christian view of faith to say it's believing without well, well, opposed to evidence. Well, let me ask how you would 
pretend if you were to define faith, what would you say faith is, Hemant? Well, let me pull out my pocket copy of the God Delusion back here. <laughs> <laughs> no, You've uh, always got it on you, yes. No, faith is... I, I understand when I hear people say faith is believing something without evidence, the, the way I interpret that is not that they don't have a reason to believe the stuff that they believe, but that the evidence they offer is is stuff we don't consider evidence because a lot of times Christians will give you their personal testimony. This, a God spoke to me, God came to me and did this in my life or I prayed and then this happened. And it's like, no, we know, like not only do we know that's a logical fallacy, I could give you the name of that fallacy because of how it's misused. So I think the, the, the response I would have for your, your comment is, it's not the faith part that's the problem, it's, it's what we're characterizing as evidence. And I think even Doubting Thomas like saw Jesus, right? Like, he did. experienced him. That's a different story than, but if you said you experienced him and then you expect me to believe it based on what you're saying, it's like, that's not really the same I, thing. Is that the kind of evidence well, you would be bringing when you say, I have a faith that's based on evidence as well? Well, Sean. if you read the story of Thomas, it's interesting. He had evidence. He had the predictions that Jesus had made. He had the testimony of his 10 buddies who he spent three years with who said, hey, we've seen him alive. That's a kind of evidence. Now it's, that's, it's a kind of bad evidence. That's what I'm saying. Like, like you my, think that's bad yes. evidence? Oh, absolutely. Are you kidding me? Oh, yeah, 10 yeah. people in your life that yeah. you know uh -huh. see something they didn't expect and come to you with personal testimony. Everyone in my life that thinks America's evidence. Got Talent is the best show they've ever seen. <laughs> Like, they're wrong. That's totally <laughs> different. And I agree with you on that, by the way. But the point is, like, yes, people you trust say, this thing happened to me. Okay, I'm listening, but I'm not taking that as proof because it's not the same thing as me experiencing it. And I think that's a legit thing to say. Like, okay, all these people saw him. They experienced it. What was the first thing you said before the, the 10 people? Uh, you said um, the other example so of evidence. So yeah, predictions of Jesus. Yeah, and, and again, and he predictions. Had so we appearances. Heard, and I would say like, okay, predictions, but psychics make predictions that we tend to think come true if we believe that stuff. Yeah. Okay. So do you so, throw out all testimony in a court of law? If you have ten people who say we saw him, we witnessed this, you're gonna go, wow, ten? Yeah, it's hearsay that's evidence. That's a pretty. I mean, they don't accept that in court. That, that's not hearsay <laughs> evidence. If you have ten people who come to you and say we saw this and testify then you say, for it, yeah, then you say, okay, I'm listening to all of you. I will weigh that into consideration. But sure. that alone, what you said you saw, I'm not putting this guy in jail based on just what you said. We got to take a lot of stuff into consideration. And I will say one thing I definitely appreciate about about you, your father, about Christian apologists in general, is that they've kind of they've built their whole life around this idea that we have all this evidence. We want to answer that and present it to people. I have a lot of respect for that. That's, that's what we want to see. And then we can get into a debate about why isn't this, sure. you know, mm -hmm. valid evidence for other people. But that's the sort of thing, like the evidence you're talking about is stuff that I think a lot of atheists would say, that's not convincing enough for okay, me. Okay, so here, here's my point. I t obviously, if you're an atheist, you're going to reject the evidence. But that's different than characterizing faith as belief without evidence. Eyewitness testimony is a kind of evidence. Pointing to something in creation and DNA is a kind of evidence. Now, you reject it and don't believe it. Right. But that doesn't make faith itself without evidence. That's my only point. Right, and we're disagreeing on the definition of what's so, good evidence. Look, I was just at Biola's fall faculty training, and our guest speaker said there is no room within Christianity for intellectual laziness and not using your minds. Why? Because Jesus said, love God with your mind. Come let us reason together. So faith's not the opposite of reason. Reason can't get us there all the way, but right. it's built upon evidence if, if would I, be the... If, if I can interrupt you, I, I mean, I think of you both as rational, intelligent, well-read people who uh, are both looking at the same set of data, if you like, and coming to different conclusions about it. Obviously, you've found the historical evidence and the philosophical evidence, the theological evidence, Sean, compelling, and you say, it's, it, it, this makes sense. Um, maybe Hemant has looked at a lot of that stuff and says, no, it doesn't do enough for me. Uh, I'd be interested to know for you, Hemant, what kind of evidence do you think might hypothetically 
persuade you that God exists or Christianity is true? What, what would be the kind of evidence you'd be looking for? I think if you're talking me personally, mm -hmm. it, at this point, I feel like I've heard enough from the apologist side, those kind of the standard arguments you've heard, that none of that has convinced me so far, so I'm not sure anything, like if you look at this Bible passage, boom, that's not gonna do it. Okay. It may have to be like a personal thing I go through. So it could be point. some kind of a personal experience, some- But, yes, it would okay. have to be a personal experience, but a lot of people have personal experiences <laughs> and they can attest that's, to them. That's the problem, I suppose. And that yeah. doesn't mean it's real. I mean, I've, I've seen enough of those books because they sell mm. a lot of copies mm. about, I swear I died and I <laughs> went to heaven and I know exactly what happens sure. there. And it just so happens that all those stories are identical for more or less. You know what yeah. I mean? Like so, your personal belief so doesn't So it's hard for you to kind of, at this point, know what sort of evidence could actually convince you in that in that sense. I would have, I think, a lot more questions about even trusting my own uh, experience at that point, because I would be like, well, did I really experience what I think I did? What holes can you poke in my story right I, now? I suppose, you know? though, most atheists I meet say, want to say I'm an evidence-based person, but is your own position of atheism somehow, can it actually be tested if I'm just wondering, could, could you falsify your atheism on the basis that you can't think of anything that might... Well, the falsification of atheism to me is prove you're right. You know what I mean? It's... So, but atheism is the default kind of the way the world is unless you show me right. that, that God exists. That's accurate. That's, that's... And what do you think of that way of kind of approaching, well, atheism is the default. You're, it's your job oh, to show totally me God exists. Oh, I totally disagree. Exists. Okay. I think both belief systems have explanations for reality where the universe came from, where life came from, where consciousness comes from. Uh, both explanations, what happens that you die, if anything or not. Both belief systems answer them differently, but give explanations for why we're here and for the big questions of life. So are you saying atheism offers Hammond needs some to defend answer. his atheism as much as you need to defend your if there's, Christian If faith. there's any middle ground, it would be agnosticism. Right. But I think atheism has to defend that the universe can come from nothing, that it can be fine-tuned without a cause, consciousness can come from matter, life can do, come do from non-life. Do you think that's actually something you have to do, Hemant, as an atheist, no. kind of give an account for no, those I mean, kinds of things? No, I mean, those are good questions to ask. Mm. How did this appear? How do we explain this stuff? And we can't answer every one of those questions to the satisfaction, to the point where it would appear in like a science book somewhere, because there are things we don't know. The question is, how are we gonna get to those answers? And I don't think you're gonna get to those answers through God, through faith, through the Bible, whatever. If we can figure things out, it's gonna be through evidence-based reason. It's gonna be through, through experimentation, through theories and testing them and trying to falsify them. So when it comes to why did the universe appear this way, I mean, those are, there are some, you could test that to a limit, but right now, maybe that's as far as we can go. We can't answer everything about it, so we have to just live with that. The fact that there aren't answers to everything, the, one of the problems I have with religion is that they, it seems like a lot of religious people have a hard time accepting there are things we don't know. Quick, and quick, so they make up answers. Quick response, Sean, and then we'll move on to Hemant's next. Uh, I have no problem admitting I don't know something. I think one of the differences is I, I hear you use the word proof, and when I read your book, Certainty, I agree. Answering these questions doesn't require proof or certainty. What I look at is I say two different worldviews and others, which best explains certain features of the natural world. Can I prove it beyond any reasonable doubt? Not 100% certainty. But I'm a Christian because I think theology, the Christian worldview best answers the big questions of life. That's why I'm a Christian. So and I maybe think one we problem, differ over the standard of proof that we're looking for. Maybe one issue I have is that Christians also think they have answers not just to the big questions, but also to a lot of the small ones that we do have other explanations to. And that's kind of when, when kind of like when the religious people are shoving themselves into my world. You know what I mean? Like, like DNA or science stuff. It's like, well, now you're interfering in my little arena well, here. I think we might come to this a bit later. Okay. Let's go to your next misconception. Yeah, the other misconception people have about atheists that, that I thought was not really Googleable, which is why I gave them to you. 
is that I think there's this idea that when you hear about atheists in the news, if you ever see, you know, this atheist group was attacking this, whatever, a lawsuit or whatever, it's because they're intolerant of Christianity or because they're trying to eradicate faith from the public space. So the kind of, the atheists are just so intolerant of people of faith. That's the, the misconception. Yeah, and the weird thing is like, I don't work for any of those groups, but I know a lot of the people who do, and I talk with them all the time. I know what their thinking is on this stuff, and that's never come up, not in private, <laughs> not, certainly not in public, but it's kind of... There's a not lo- a hidden agenda to bring down the Christian church. Yeah, no. Uh, believe me, I, would, I feel like I would know about that yeah. one. <laughs> they would You'd have told me that at some point. A, well, would you tell us, though, Heaven? <laughs> you know, no, I, I'm joking. <laughs> But, I'm but blinking in code to certain people <laughs> in the audience. Um, no, but a lot of the times what I see is a lot of the atheist groups. When, whenever you see a lawsuit, the lawsuit is almost always, we want the government to play this thing neutral. Mm-hmm. I don't want you advocating for atheism, but mm-hmm. I also don't want you advocating for Christianity or for religion. We see you doing that, and we're trying to put a stop to it. And I think a lot of religious people see that as because Christians are the only ones who ever seem to do that, like we want in God we trust in all these public schools, big signs, or we want to teach creationism along with uh, evolution or whatever. And when that gets, when uh, lawsuits say, no, you got to put a stop to that, to me, that is neutrality. Like we're not telling you what religion to believe, but I think neutrality to a lot of conservative Christians is persecution. Right, so so the kind of atheists who kind of active... Uh, are activists for kind of making sure we keep a kind of secular space, a kind of neutral space. And to be clear, not atheist space, but a secular, we're not advocating And and that's often, in your view, misinterpreted by Christians as as somehow attacking Christianity. You will not see an atheist group say, we want a sign in every school that says, in God we don't trust. (laughs) We don't want them doing that, but lay off. Okay. Sean, what's your response to to that kind of view? Uh, So we might differ as we get to some of the particulars, but in general, I agree with the way that you stated that, that I've often told Christians, I've said, look, if you care about religious liberty for Christians, you have to care about religious liberty for Muslims. Yeah. You have to care about religious liberty for people who don't have a specific faith. Yeah. It actually should be neutral. So it might shock some people, but I don't know that I was ever in favor of prayers being mandated in schools. I don't know that that's necessarily the place. I'm not in favor of creationism being taught. Now, I think you should, some weaknesses of evolution should be allowed in. You might differ with that, but that's very different, letting kids think critically and interact and come to truth themselves. So I I think in general, we have to be consistent. We have to see, try to understand where the other person is coming from. And frankly, as Christians, we probably haven't really done a great job at this. Do, do, you, do you say that to other Christians? I'm I Because you know all the people that probably do a lot of those lawsuits sure. or things. Do you, what, do you have that conversation with them ever? I have had that conversation. How does that go? Um, I'm so curious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just, I guess it depends on the person. People process it very differently. I, I'm not afraid to tell people, here's what I think, and you're stepping on toads, and you're not being fair, and so... I, I tell them and they listen. Sometimes they probably think I'm nuts and see it differently. But I think we have common ground. And I think when we get to some of the particulars of what it means to be neutral and fair, yeah. probably you and I would differ over what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in principle, I think, I think religion should have a voice. I think sometimes the concern is that it feels like secular efforts are saying religion doesn't even get a seat. They don't even get a voice. They don't get to speak into it. I don't want to say time out. There can be different voices. Everybody should get a seat at the table in a pluralistic society. It makes me laugh slash cry whenever I hear people are like, there's no room, or atheists are trying to make sure there's no room for religion in politics. And it's like, there's literally one atheist in Congress, and he doesn't even call himself an atheist. And there's like four, five hundred Christians, different denominations. It's like, what part of... Christianity is out of politics. They're all in there. If you want to trade because you think you're being persecuted, I will swap with you any day you want. <laughs> so I, I think the concern, and this is, this is going to maybe take it down a different road, is I read the book that you published. I think it was called Queer Disbelief. Yeah. And it was really interesting. And it was about and, just uh, religion and LGBTQ rights. That's the okay. gist of it. Kind of well. atheists and LGBTQ rights together. And you yeah. edited it, wrote the foreword. Yeah. And the, I forget her name, I'm sorry. Camille is the author. Camille. Yeah. 
She said, not the golden rule, treat others the way you would want them to treat you. She called it like the platinum rule. Treat people the way that they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And right now we're seeing this tension between somebody who goes, look, I want to be able to go to a bakery and I just want to get a cake and not be treated differently because I'm in a same-sex relationship. Mm -hmm. And you have, say, somebody like in Colorado who says, I, I, there's a lot of things I don't serve. I just want to be able to operate my business according to my deepest held convictions. Now, we don't have to solve this now, but that's where the tension comes into play. And charity on both sides, trying to understand and meet a middle ground, like I think happened at least now in California with AB 2943, is the stuff we're working out that makes it not yeah. easy. Yeah, and believe me, there's a but, lot I want to say about the Colorado guy, mm -hmm. too. Um, we probably the, won't have time tonight, I, but I understand it's, a, it's a huge completely. can of worms, yeah. No, I, and I think, yeah, you're right. Those are the details. Where do we draw the line? That is kind of what's at stake there. Um, and again, it, to me, it seems like whenever people advocate for neutrality, the religious side that tends to get all the attention in these cases is saying, we want a right that we would never accept if a Muslim wanted to do that to a Christian, or if anyone else tried to do the stuff we're doing right now, they would be the first people in line crying foul. But they want, this, they want the ability to do that sort of thing. And he, 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 here's how... I think if we would try to have some charity and understand where the other person is coming from, we could make a lot of progress on this. Do you so, think... Sorry, I don't... Let finish. me throw this and yeah. then jump in. So I feel like I, I look at an issue contentious like, say, same-sex marriage, and I have opinions that I've thought through, mm -hmm. not just from the Bible, but what I think the nature of marriage is. I don't look at people who disagree with me and go, man, you're hateful, you're bigoted. I look at them, I say, you know what? You're doing what you think is right, and I'm going to give you the respect and dignity and charity, even though I disagree on the issues, of treating you with that kindness and respect. I don't get treated with the same, not from everybody, maybe it's just the vocal voices. I don't often feel like that charity is extended to me personally. Maybe you feel that people treat you the same from my side. I don't know. No, it's because but, the people who want to get, same, just to take that as an example, the people who want to get married, they're not telling you what you can and can't do. But when you say you don't want them to get married, you're telling them they're not allowed to do it. And you're passing laws to tell them they're not allowed to do this or that. Like, it's not just a difference of opinion. It's you get control over them in a way they don't get over you. And there's a difference. It's not just no, a difference of opinion in these cases. The point is not to have control over somebody. The question would be, what is marriage? What is it? That's a prior question that has to be answered before we even talk about legislation. Yeah. We skip over that and start attributing to people certain motivations. And I, it's, it's unbelievably uncharitable at times. The way I think people will treat me and my side, I go, well, how do you know somebody's motivated by hate? How do you know that's what somebody's thinking? Let's see where they're coming from and make sense of it we're, and understand the their problem is One, one quick are, response and we'll go to the final no, there, misconception. People can smile and end up doing some really horrible stuff. So it's not that I think that's everyone true. who believes this I stuff is that. hateful, but the end result's the same. So you have to respond to it we, we no, could spend the whole evening debating yeah. this issue, so I, I, we, we, we'll, we'll have to leave it there. Cause, um, it, so it's we're a, not going to resolve all of the culture not, wars no. in a couple of minutes? Gay cakes and gay marriage, we, we're not going to, I think, um, completely solve tonight. <laughs> but um, let's go to the final misconception that you think, Sean, uh, atheists sometimes have of Christians. Yes, so my misconception is that Christianity is inherently in conflict with science. Now, I know you have videos on this and have huge opinions about it, so make a couple comments and then let, let you go yeah. see what you think. So, my point is not historically there ha to say that there hasn't been conflict. Of course, there has. Um, my point is not that there's not certain positions within Christianity that come into conflict with majority mainstream held views in science. That happens at time. But I don't think when we understand the limits and nature of science and Christianity itself essential doctrines, there's necessarily a conflict between the two of them. That would be, I could defend it, but... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt there are brilliant scientists who are also Christians and very much Bible-believing and all that. They find a way to work it out. I can't say I understand that completely, but they exist. There's no doubt about that. I think my where I would respond to that one is there are times when it's, 
to believe in miracles, to believe in a virgin birth, to believe in things that could not happen because we don't have a mechanism for that to happen, and to say this stuff happens has to go in conflict with what we know from evidence, which does require faith. But that to me, it's, these are not separate issues to say that God can override the science when he wants to. Okay, Those so, are going so into if conflict. There's, if there's a God who exists, spoke the world into existence, organized the law according to the regularity that it operates on, why couldn't this God at times act, do a resurrection, heal somebody? This doesn't overturn science. In fact, a miracle can only happen if there is a regularity and a pattern that happens for there to be something noticeable that makes it a miracle. So I don't see why a miracle contradicts science because a miracle is a claim that God has acted supernaturally. Right. Science is a systematic examination of the natural world. If there's any way to break that systematic mechanism, science is broken, but it's not. That's the whole point of it. It's that this is the rules we use to figure things out we may get better information over time and we may adjust as we need to, but in terms of how do we figure out what's going on, these are the rules we're using. And I, I feel like what you're saying is, we can just break the rules whenever we want. They don't matter. God wants to break them, he can break them. You're that, just playing that, a game with no rules that's now. That's <laughs> totally not what I'm saying. I think that's a mischaracterization of what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you look at Newton and Pascal and Boyle and Galileo down the road, some of these scientific pioneers believed that you could do science because the world was rational, it was orderly, there was a regularity to it built in by their faith, right. and then God can act above or beyond. Just like if you drop this down, the laws of nature would say it's gonna fall. I could stop it as an agent, as a person prevented from doing it. I didn't violate science. But at the same time, all of those guys existed way before we knew what DNA was, how genes worked, all the, all the science that has happened in the past 50 years, 100 years, they didn't know any of that stuff. And some of these things, just simple things like, how come you look like a mixture of your parents? Without genes and DNA, it's really hard to kind of explain that one. So what other reason do you have for it? I can understand why they would resort to the supernatural explanations for some of this stuff, because they didn't have better stuff. They didn't have better tools. They didn't have better knowledge. We are getting, I mean, you've heard this before, because it's sure. called the God of the Gaps. But like, as we learn more, it's like, oh, that thing I thought God had something to do with, it has a reason now. And it falls into that systematic mechanism we were talking about. Um, okay. Here's the, so, one of the things you mentioned with God can interfere when God wants to, is that it seems like all the stories people give, there either are natural explanations for them when they say it's a miracle, or it happened in the past and we're relying on a hand, Jesus resurrected. Here's the evidence we're using for that one. And by the way, it's never gonna happen okay. again, or we haven't seen it happen so, again. So, so, so Sean, Keeners. the question I think here is, is uh, given that the, the miracles reported in the Bible came from what you might call a pre-scientific age, should we accept that that was their interpretation, and science probably would give us the answer to what people uh, no, thought No, these are the scientific saw. pioneers that brought science into the day and led the scientific revolution. But if you read K Craig Keener's two-volume set on miracles, there are tens of millions of miracle accounts. Some are tested better than others that are, some very strongly, that simply can't be dismissed with the assumption that we live in a naturalistic world. Is it That's an assumption. Is it possible that with those miracles, if different people looked at them, different people uh, accounted for... I, I see this a lot when the Catholic Church names saints. So I'm not talking got, about the Catholic no, Church I know, I know. saints. But, no, 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 but their, their explanation of how do you say Mother Teresa is a saint, she had to have performed two miracles, and they say these are the miracles. Okay. It's like, well, there actually are explanations for some of the to naturally explain what they think is supernatural. So, so this is an assumption. Couldn't the, couldn't the same thing happen with the ones you're talking about? So if you say it's possible, anything's possible. That's not what's interesting to me. I want to know what's reasonable, okay? So there's a difference between how good is the evidence and is a miracle in itself contradictory to the nature of science. Those are different things. Sometimes so, I think when I, we say we don't know how this happened, there are people who jump to miracle and 
it's possible we just don't have all the information. Okay, so God of the gaps is when you don't have an answer, you just insert God into right. it. Right, right. The miracle claims, including the resurrection and modern day ones, there is positive evidence for it. Now, you might not accept it, right. but all I'm saying is it's, it's a mischaracterization to say that science and Christianity are at odds. That doesn't necessarily follow. If there is a God and he made the world and he spoke it into existence, this God can act through the world and wouldn't be limited. He wouldn't even be violating these laws or interfering because he set up these laws. Do, do you so, believe, that as an atheist though, Hemant, that science is somehow more um, naturally correlates with atheism than with Christianity? I mean, would you say, you know, the fact that many of the most vocal proponents of atheism are scientists is because somehow science validates atheism in some way? I think when you realize, oh, to believe in any religion any of the major religions and the specifics that go along with them, you have to accept at some point that supernatural things happened and will continue to happen uh, and will go on. After you're dead, they're still happening. And when you realize, oh, all the stuff we know about how the world works, it did not come because it was written in a book. It's because we explored it, we looked into it. This is the best answers we have. These are the best answers we have given the way, given the rules of our game which is to say, let's prove it as best we can, and not because someone told it to us. Yeah, I think, it's, I think there's an easy leap to go from, oh, we can figure this stuff out if we have the right information, to, oh, the people who just so make So it's kind of, it does, oh. in your view, squeeze God out in that sense. Um, I, doesn't squeeze God out, but you don't need God. Right, you, need sure. better, yeah. you need better information. What, what's your view? I mean, very often science is kind of held up as, as somehow, you know, Atheists love science. It's science basically supports atheism. Why do you think that's a wrong way of, of approaching it, Sean? Well, I think two things. I think science requires certain presuppositions about the world being orderly, about our minds matching up with it, that are very at home and have been encouraged by a Christian worldview. I think this can be documented historically. Second, I actually think the more we look into the depths of the cell and the depths of the universe, I think Psalms 19, 1 and 2 is right, that the skies proclaim the glory of God. Meaning, we discover DNA. It's more complex and sophisticated than we ever could have imagined. We discovered through science in the 20th century that the universe had a beginning. This seems reasonably to point to a cause outside of the universe. We discover fine-tuning. We discover certain things in science. I don't think science proves God. It's not that simple. But I think the more we probe and look into the natural world, the more we find sophistication, we find complexity, we find beauty that makes sense if there is a mind behind the universe. And it's not just scientists from the Middle Ages. Some of the leading scientists today would see it the same way. Some. So, <laughs> I, agree. I agree. By the way, we've That's got true. about two minutes before we need to go to questions. So um, did you want to come back on that quickly, Hemant? No, I mean, I, I think the, there are atheists who will say those are two separate arenas, that it's theoretically possible to believe in the religious stuff but when you're in the lab, you're not bringing the Bible into it. You're focusing on the science. But I think, by and large, the, the growing number of atheists, anecdotally I'm saying this, is that a lot of the religious beliefs directly contradict what we know from science, and those two things cannot coexist. Just a final word from you, Sean, and we'll try and go Richard to Dawkins questions. said, biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed. Well, maybe it gives the appearance of having been designed because it's actually designed. Yeah, and you don't have to get that from a book. Right. You look in the natural world and you see that it's reasonable and not against science to infer maybe there's a mind behind this. But the whole reason he wrote that sentence is to spend the entire book explaining why it's not designed. It's, let me explain to you why it looks that way, but it's not. But the intuition <laughs> is there. Right, because that that's people how you speak to people. Have. <laughs> you speak to people. Let me speak your language, not you guys, just in general. Let me speak your language. You think it looks designed. I know it looks, looks designed, but let me tell you why it's not actually designed. That's the whole point of the book. Uh, do you want to respond in the book? Do, we'll, do we'll, I have time? Well, well. <laughs> yeah, so... My, my only point is the world, as we look out into it, looks designed. And there's multiple other scientists and people who do the same thing. You don't have to compartmentalize your faith to do that science. You look at it and ask, okay, is it actually designed? Now, we could debate with Dawkins, and obviously I disagree where he goes with it. But my only point about this misconception is to say that science is at odds with Christianity. 
And that's not the case that it's at odds with Christianity when we properly understand what it is. So if the science points away from design, so be it. If it's point towards design, so be it. We'll, we'll leave Let's it there the for evidence. the moment. Maybe we'll, we can follow it up in the, in the Q&A. So this is, uh, this is great. We've, we've had a really wonderful discussion, lively, engaging, civil, as I fully expected to be between you both. And now it's time to go to some questions from the audience. Now, uh, if Richard, where is Richard, who's feeding me some, some of these text questions? Uh, give me a wave, Richard. I'm not seeing anything on my phone at this point, Richard, so it might be um, that, that you might want to bring some questions over to me physically if they're not coming through for any reason. But um, we, we're going to try and um, bring some of your questions. Do you Feel free to continue to text that, as we... Yeah, sure. Pick. Hello, hello. Oh, there we, I'm back again. Feel free to continue to text as we bring some of these questions up, and um, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll get through as many as we can. What I'll do, guys, is um, for each question, if it's aimed at a spe either of you specifically, I'll have you answer it, and then a quick response from the other, and vice versa, and uh, and we'll get through as many as we can. Thank you, Richard. You can be my personal assistant if you like. Okay. <laughs> Five. Keep them coming. We got five questions. Mm-hmm. Is this on? Keep using that one. Okay. <laughs> we, we'll we we'll swap over in a minute. Okay. Um, okay. We have had some questions here. Let me, let me ask this one first of all. This is to, to either of you. Uh, what motivates atheists and Christians to argue their case about life, faith, and meaning? So what's the motivation for why you're here having this discussion debate? Um, you know, there are so few things, I feel, like in my own life that I get super riled up and passionate about. But this is one of them. I mean, the big questions, the... The fact that I think I'm right about something that most of the country, I think, is totally wrong about. Yeah, you get excited about that. And it's not just religion, by the way. Maybe it's politics. Maybe it's a sports team, whatever. When there's something you're really excited about, you want to share it. I know Christians have said the same thing about their faith. But this is the thing that gets me really worked up. I get excited writing about it. I get excited mm -hmm. talking about it and, and meeting people, yeah. whether they agree with me or not. You're about passionate it. about it. Okay, yeah. Sean. Uh, two reasons. I actually love the pushback, and I love the conversation, whether it's on stage or not, because if I'm wrong about something, I should probably change my beliefs. I'm going to go back and think through this whole conversation in my mind probably a bunch of times. <laughs> so that's one reason I enjoy it. Second is ideas do have confidence. Ideas do have consequences. And I'm a Christian. I think Jesus got reality right. And not only did he call us to do this, but to me, it's an act of love to talk to people. And I think you'd probably say you're motivated by the same thing for different reasons. It's loving to have conversations with people and help them see what's true. So I enjoy it. I want to learn myself. I deeply care about ideas. I get as passionate as you do. I just enjoy the conversation. And when it's all said and done, we don't spend a lot of time in the world really weighing on issues that matter. We get mm. distracted. These questions have consequences about science and faith, about how we treat atheists. If we can treat atheists better, we need to be listening and we need to do that better. And, and if I can add to that, no, uh, I agree with you on that. It's funny because on my website, I don't necessarily talk about a lot of the things we've been talking about today. Hmm. It's a lot of the consequences that I'm talking about because I think religion does a lot of damage. And that's kind of what I spend a lot of my time doing. It's documenting it. It's saying... This belief has led us down this path, and that's, the bad, that's a bad path to go down. Here's why. But, yeah, that's kind of, it's the, the, the consequences of it that get me passionate, too. Would More you, so would, maybe than the would, philosophy Would you it. profile good things that happen from, yes, from religion? Yes, and I have, well. and I do, and sometimes, even when it comes to lawsuits and stuff, mm -hmm. this happened this week, mm -hmm. where a, a group I would categorize as a very conservative legal group, uh, they were right about something. And okay. I wrote about that, and I said, they are right about okay. this. Yeah. This one's for you specifically, Hemant. Um, I think it is, at least. Do you think atheists should be disappointed that there's no God? That's an interesting question. Um, I That's mean, an interesting. Uh, and maybe another way of phrasing it, would you, would you like there to be a God? Is it kind of a shame if there isn't a God? Yeah, it, 
It's, I've thought about it in different ways because part of it is who cares if I'm going to be happy or sad? The question is what's true, whether I like it or not. But at the same time, I don't, which God are we talking about that I want to exist? The one that's going to send me to hell if I disobey him? The one that is trying to command every little bit of my life and tell me how to live every single way? Like, I have enough of that with my parents. I don't need it, you know, supernaturally as well. So again, it depends. Would it, look, would it be really nice to know that after I die, I, I can go to heaven? Yeah, that, would, that sounds lovely to a point. Like, yeah, that sounds nice, except I don't think that's true. But yeah, the idea sounds nice. I get why religion is comforting. And there are times when I'm like, that comfort would be nice to have if I believed in it. Sure. Sean? Yeah, this is a tricky one. I guess, and I know it's bigger than this, but the way you describe God, I wouldn't want that God to exist. (laughs) I think when we look at the person of Jesus, who said, greater love hath no man than this, that lays down his life for a friend. His compassion, his grace, the life that he lived. I want that to be true. Now, I don't believe it just because I want it to be true. But I think there's something unbelievable about his life. And if I didn't believe in that, or I came to the conclusion it wasn't true, I would definitely have a huge vacuum, so to speak, in my life. Let's go to another question. Um... Here's an interesting one. What do atheists and Christians do in a time of crisis? Uh, I mean, obviously, I guess for you, Sean, your faith sustains you in many ways when you are going through any time of crisis. I think um, it'd be interesting to know, firstly, from you, Hemant, where you turn when life is going wrong, what, you know, when, it, when it's all coming so down around your ears. The short answer is you rely on your friends and your family and whatever brings you comfort, sure. There is a, a woman I know who, had to, who went through the tragedy of losing her child, and she was looking for resources as an atheist because she couldn't find any because all the resources talk about religious stuff. So she actually started a site, it's called Grief Beyond Belief, where she just tried to compile that stuff. And I will tell you, so many of the messages that I've gotten over the years are people asking the same question, which is, I went through a breakup Uh, I lost a parent, I lost a family member, someone I love. What can I do? Because the answers are not there necessarily. Mm. And I've referred them to that website so many times. But because the infrastructure of of having people there to help you out, it's so much better developed in a church than it is, I think, for a lot of atheists. But the short answer is what pretty much what I think you would expect is you find comfort in your friends, your family. You don't have to believe that there's something in the afterlife or beyond. If you're an atheist, you don't believe that stuff. You, you're realistic about it from their perspective. But you're looking for comfort wherever you can find it. Sean, um, you can comment on what, what Hemant had to say, but also I'd be interested in, in what the difference is in terms of where you find comfort as a Christian. Uh, honestly, for me, I think it goes back to the resurrection. Because if Jesus has not risen, Christianity is false. If he's risen, there is eternal life. And God is in control and has a reason even if I can't see and understand certain things that happen. I think of my friend Nabil Qureshi who died, an apologist, recently. Terrible. Doesn't make sense from a human perspective. And he had a video where he walked through. He said, I walk through what I know to be true about God as a creator, about the resurrection, about fulfilled prophecy. He goes, I know this is true with his family, with his friends that gave him comfort through the pain and through the hurt. I haven't been through what he went through, but I think believing in the resurrection where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? I think that's a part of the power of the resurrection. And that's obviously a difference that you and I have, but when there's hurt and there's pain, that's something that is very meaningful to me. If I can add one thing, which is, I don't know whether I would want God to exist, the question you went to earlier, like even if there was proof, would I want him to? But I have, there's a number of times, and I don't feel any shame in saying this, where I wish I had the sort of structure that a church has, because when things are going wrong in your life, churches are really good at helping you through that stuff. And there have been attempts at atheist versions of that stuff. Sometimes they're, okay. Sometimes they fall apart pretty quickly, but 
that's a tough thing Can to I, not is have. Is it just the life. structure or is it some of the beliefs behind? None of the beliefs. None be, of the beliefs. No, I, no, no, no. And it's not the beliefs. It's the idea that, wow, these people get together. They're passionate about the same stuff. They will... Bring a chicken soup. Yes. They will help you through the rough times. Okay. Uh, physically, neighborly. Yes, that is a big deal. And, and one of the things I've tried to communicate to other atheists too is if you think you have some arguments... Uh, the, the God delusion type of arguments that will take someone who believes in God and get them away from it, that's not going to work for a lot of people because if you're saying, I, need you to, I want you to stop believing in God and here's why, that'll work for some people, but for a lot of them, you're asking them to give up what they have in their churches. That's a hard sell. That may be a harder sell than getting mm. them to let go of God. Right. And unless you have a place for them to yeah. go... Yeah. That's a tough thing to convince anybody to do. Let's go to another question. Um, this one is a slightly more technical one. It says, Christianity seems to presume that there is absolute truth that we have access to. How do you both feel about humankind's access to absolute truth? I guess there's a few different ways you could interpret that question, but essentially it seems to be boiling down to, is there a kind of absolute truth about reality that we, we can have access to? Can we know the way things are? Is there, maybe this applies to morality, you know, that there are absolute moral truths uh, and things like that. Um, and what does that say about the nature of reality? I don't know whether you want to st- kick this one off, Sean, for us. Um, sure. So I do not use the term absolute truth because I think it's confusing on a lot of different levels. When someone says, do we have absolute truth, do they mean exhaustive truth? Do they mean something that's true for everybody? Like the term dies the death of a thousand qualifications. What I think there is, is objective truth. And I think we would agree on this. We would differ over what is true, but I do believe that we have access to truth. So what do you mean by objective truth as opposed to? I think, so subjective truth is an internal feeling or belief or preference. Objective truth is something about the external world that is real, whether you believe it or not. So if you don't believe this cup is sitting here for whatever reason, that's wrong because that's objectively true. Mm -hmm. So objective truths are things that we can know. I think there's objective truth in morality. I think there's objective truth when it comes to religion. I think there can be objective truth in science and history in a number of different fields. But to answer the question, there is a truth, and I think we can know it. This this brings me back to an episode of Unbelievable that you contributed to a while back, Hemant. I don't know if you'll remember it, but I, I brought you on with... Um, uh, Leah Labresco, who was a former uh, co-blogger on the atheist channel of the Pathos oh, yeah. Network. But she actually converted to Christianity, interestingly. Mm. And part of her conversion was um, coming to believe that there really was objective moral truths in the world, moral values and duties. Um, and for her, that was the thing that brought her across the, the line from atheism to believing there's a God. She felt that you cannot... Um, have a world of real objective moral facts and duties and truths without there being something beyond simply matter and motion to ground it. She believed there had to be a God to, to ground that. Now, when I, I remember when you came on to discuss that with her, you just, you just couldn't, didn't understand why that had, had, had taken her there. I don't know whether your thinking has progressed on that in any way in the, in the few years since, but are you, do you find this in any way a kind of plausible it's, or interesting argument? It's still not a convincing argument to me. I don't know anyone who's followed her down that path. I know, would, I know a few people, okay. uh, but, but yes, you haven't um, personally come into contact and, with And I don't, I don't think I necessarily buy into there's an objective truth about all of this stuff. It's, mm-hmm. it's what we bring to the table that okay. kind of creates those... So truths. you're not sure there is an objective moral nature to, to the world. No, because people disagree about even simple stuff now. We, there's, I don't think we're aiming towards a certain place. Uh, just like I don't think evolution is like led to us. You know what I mean? It's not like it's all leading to a certain spot. It's kind of mm-hmm. what we make of it when we get there. Okay. But you think it's, just for clarification, you think it's objectively wrong to sexually abuse a child? Would you say that yes. is... So you I do believe w- no, 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 hang on. Let me answer truth. that. Let me finish my answer on that. No, I think it's obviously, that's horrible, that's wrong. I think, this is the thing, that to me seems like a black and white issue, but again, there's plenty of, black, I think, uh, killing people should, you would think that would be an objective truth, but we live in a country where we have the death penalty. There are nations that are firmly religious that kill people 
because they think that's the right punishment for whatever the crime is. I mean, yes, I, I agree with you. Like, no, sexual, we should never sexually abuse anyone. We should punish anyone who do. But I'm saying there are a lot of things that we think are pretty hardcore. This has to be wrong that we will find people who are arguing the other side to that. But sure. that's true with science. You, you think I'm wrong about evolution doesn't mean there's not a truth about evolution. No, I think right? when I say someone's wrong about evolution, it's they misunderstand it. It's not that they... No, no, no. If I say it didn't happen, so hypothetically, you think I'm wrong about it because you think it did happen. Okay? But that's... So the fact that some people are wrong doesn't mean there's not an objective truth. No, it's this is the best explanation we have right now. It is entirely possible we'll learn something different. Okay. Maybe we overturn evolution. It, I don't think that's going to happen. But are there some things that are indubitably true, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, the earth is round, and it's wrong to sexually abuse a child? Like... All you have to do is have one thing, and there is objective truth, whether it's in science or morality. There is a difference That's between it. like a mathematical fact and these moral ideas that we, that we interpret. I mean, only the same in sense of being objective, being outside of us. I agree that they're different in other respects. Yeah, but I don't know where this game is going. I, I'm just asking, <laughs> the question was, do you believe there's objective truth? So you're right, some things change, and some people differ with it. But if you say, to use the example of like, say, torturing an innocent child for fun is wrong, then you have at least one objective moral truth. Or are you saying, well, maybe in the future we would have a different perspective about this and we'd think it's okay to torture a child no, for I don't. fun? Obviously, I think it's wrong. Obviously, okay. I think it should, like, I would love for that to be an objective truth, but I think in terms of we could get into a debate about how people disagree about certain aspects that are not nearly as I mean, hard, I, I, ironclad. I, I think you've asked where, where is this game going. I think where the game is going is, is was Leah Labresco right to change her mind about God because she said, if it's true that it's objectively wrong to sexually abuse children, then She's that a can... Catholic. <laughs> that church has a lot of problems okay. with that. I but... agree. You're absolutely right. <laughs> so you're, you're absolutely right. So the condemnation of the church, you and I both stand no, I against that and of say course. it's wrong. The, the point is How you're, you're, you're confirming that there is an objectiveness about what's happening here. So the question is... But just does, because does, I think she, that's she wrong believes and, and, Sean, obvious. and Sean believes that to have that kind of objective moral truth about the world means we need more than just the, what evolution happens to have given us in terms of socially helpful mores. It's, there's something actually true out there and we've discovered it. That means there's something not, laying I, down I would there. not equate these moral truths to like a mathematical two plus two equals four, therefore God exists sort of thing. That okay. to me is jumbling up a whole bunch of different ideas. Quick, quick response, Sean, and we'll, we'll move to another question. Cause... Well, I, look, one of the videos you had is that atheists can't, that Christians often say to atheists, you can't be moral if you don't believe in God. That's crazy. Of course, you defend, you're like, no, atheists can have ethics. And your blog is regularly condemning certain behavior that religious people do. And I actually agree with you. When I read your blog, I grieve because these are my people. I'm like, Hemant is right. Like, that's an abuse of power. That's taking advantage of people. Like, it pains me. I can only read it so much. But that's because you're Try not, writing you, it. <laughs> well, I agree. Like, I... I'm, I'm with you. So <laughs> the reason we agree on this is because we do think there's an objective moral truth about this. It's really wrong. And that raises questions. Where does this come from? Is there actually a standard? Do humans have intrinsic value? Is there free will? So I think atheists can be moral, but I don't think atheism can ground the moral project, which seems to be central to everything you do on your blog. That's why I think it's a pretty important question. You, I think you're taking it down this moral philosophical pathway where to me it's, I'm pointing out hypocrisy based on what you say you believe versus what you do. Which is morally and, wrong, right? And what I'm saying is when <laughs> atheists are saying this is morally wrong, it's not because, uh, it's not leading to this place where, oh, this is always the right answer and therefore whatever, like it had to come from somewhere. It's you're taking away someone's rights and freedoms. You're, if you're molesting a child, there's no consent involved. That's why it's wrong. I, they don't know what's happening. You're taking advantage of that. It's not because God created the moral truth that we shouldn't molest kids. It's because, no, they have no say in the matter. That's why that thing but is But aren't wrong. you just saying, well, that's the objective moral fact, that you shouldn't um, 
take away someone's ability to consent to something. I mean, you, you've still got an objective moral I think you're taking it in a the... place where that's not part of the equation here for so me. So hypocrisy we'll, is We'll make this the bad. final comment, and I'll okay. come to another I, question. Hypocrisy is bad. I mean, nobody has spoken out historically more against hypocrisy than Jesus. But when you say this kid didn't give consent, this assumes that human beings have rights and shouldn't be treated a certain way. It was Nietzsche who said the idea of equality and the will to power is distinctly a Christian value and the basis for all human rights. Of course, he rejected that. So I just think we're not, we're not unpacking this all the way, but if there is a moral truth, it makes sense that there's a moral law giver and an objective standard outside of us. I don't know how you get there on atheism. I don't know. That's a question that I have. It's, it's a huge question. When we're going to leave Park for the moment, it, I would love to do that the whole evening. But we, I want to get to at least a couple more questions before time runs out. So how about a completely different one here that comes in and says, what do you both think about death and afterwards mm. and why? Okay. Uh, Hemant, is it just lights out? Is that yeah. the, the answer? I mean, more or less, yeah. It's... <laughs> Your life is over. Uh, hopefully, you've spent the life that you have uh, in a way that you can be proud of. Hopefully, you leave behind a legacy. But when you die, that's what you're working off of, that legacy, because you're not going anywhere. There's no reason to think you are going anywhere other than wishful thinking. Let, let me ask the thing that might be the misconception yeah. that a Christian has. Doesn't that make life pointless? No, it makes this life so special. Okay. Because you're here. You get to experience this and enjoy this life. You can help other people do the same thing. That is motivating and inspiring, and it makes me want to make the most of this life. So the that fact doesn't that there, is, to, there I, is nothing I, after this life means it makes it more special, the life that It makes live. it more special. I'm not waking up every day in an existential crisis and, like, roll up in the fetal position and, like, oh, God... Like, I'm going to okay. die soon. What's your view on this, Sean? You know, a colleague of mine, Clay Jones at Biola, has spent months studying how people make sense of death. Now, talk about a depressing, like, study. <laughs> but he's studying it. How do different worldviews make sense of death? And some of the attempts that he's walked through with me, I think, are really desperate. And he does say, he says, a lot of people, as especially atheists, as they get older, and death is right there tend to view it very, very differently. It's one thing when you're 20, 30, 40, but when your worldview is up against the end of it, how does your worldview help you cope with death? That doesn't mean it's true or false. That's not my point. But I think sometimes this uh, attempt to paint life super rosy when life ends at the end, a lot of people who take that worldview, when they get to the end, they see it very differently when death is knocking at their doorstep. I am so curious, and I don't know the research you're talking about, but I'm really curious if one of the reasons for that is because the resources that we have now to talk about some of these things have not been available, even to atheists, for a really long time, so that you know the people who are older now and have access, not just to the internet, but people who have talked about death and written about it and all that stuff, that stuff wasn't around even 10, 20 years ago. So I wonder if he was looking at a lot of people who are toward the end of their life who did not grow up thinking about that stuff because it wasn't really in front of them like it has been for younger people, uh, younger atheists too. So I wonder if that, what your colleague found would change in like 20 or 30 well, years when they have more access and they've thought about it more. I mean, he's, he's writing on some of the even leading atheists today speaking about this very differently than they did decades ago with availability to the information in front of them. Now, what that looks like in 20, 30 years, right. nobody knows. Well, let me ask the same question, though, to you so that you can address it from your perspective, Sean. What do you think about death and afterwards, and why? Um, I think it's going to happen. I'm pretty <laughs> yeah. confident about that. <laughs> um, death and taxes. Look, I... I I mean, I don't know that anybody here wonders what Christians think happened at death. I think... Well, let me say it this way. We're all going to die barring Jesus coming back, and we're going to face our creator at death and give an account for our life. For me, I think Jesus got it right. Am I 100% certain about that? No, I'd be dishonest if I said that. But I think it makes the most sense. I think it's true. I think it fits the evidence. And because of that, that gives me a confidence to face death because I think Jesus was really God, and the words that he spoke are real and true. 
So when we die, all of us will face a creator and give an account for our life. I think that's what the Christian story teaches. Let's go to another question. Um, isn't faith a terrible basis for adopting a belief or a value? Couldn't you take anything on faith? Doesn't it shut you off from evidence? So I think this one is probably firstly being directed at you here, Sean. Um, isn't faith a terrible basis for adopting a belief or value? Doesn't it shut you off from the evidence? We kind of started here yeah. with, with one of the, your The issues. only way to answer this question is to define what we mean by faith. Mm -hmm. So if by faith you mean, what did Mark Twain say? Believe in something you know ain't so. I think he said something like that. Either have a view of faith that goes against the evidence or believing something without evidence, then I probably would agree with this person. But I don't think that's an accurate biblical definition of faith. Mm -hmm. I think faith is better understood as trusting what we have reason to believe is true. So if by faith you mean the biblical pattern, is this true? Am I gonna act in trust based on what I have, have evidence for? Then it's not foolish at all. Everybody has some kind of faith. So, I would argue, and you might disagree with this, I think atheists have to have some kind of faith. You have faith that science will explain away all those miracles. That's a form of faith. Everybody has some kind of faith. The question is, how well grounded is your faith and does your faith make sense? Yeah, and I would agree, I think Sean would agree with this too, that no, we have faith in our relationships with other people. Do they really love me? Well, you base it on the evidence there, right? Right. It's just a matter of, do we agree that this is I, I valid often, evidence? I often Reasonable. think that right. I sometimes that. what we use as the word faith or what the Bible translates as faith sometimes can be translated as trust as well. And, and yeah. f for me, I often think of that as well. We may believe something, but trusting in it is a slightly different thing. So uh, there's a famous story of, of Blond Blondini. He was um, the escapologist and tightrope walker, and he, he would walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Right. And, uh, and he would do it with a wheelbarrow and then put a, a sack of potatoes in the wheelbarrow. And one day the King of England came to watch him do it. And, uh, and Blondini said to him, uh, do, you, do you believe that I could put a man in this wheelbarrow and take him across Niagara Falls? And the king said, yes, I absolutely believe it. And he said, hop in then. And, <laughs> and that's where, where the faith is actually placing your trust in something that you, you have evidence for. But of course, that's where the rubber hits the road, that's isn't good. it? That's the, the, the trust is part is, is when you actually put your life in the hands of this. Can I ask him a beliefs. quick question? I, I'm curious yeah, yeah, yeah. just how you'd answer this. So... Neither of us have all the information. Right. We look at the evidence and we trust what we think is reasonable. I have no problem saying as a Christian, I have faith. Would you be willing to say as an atheist, you have faith or is there something about that words? Because uh, I know the in, connotation of the word, so I don't like using it unless I know what I'm talking about. So do I have faith in what? Do you have faith that atheism can explain reality, that science will explain away all miracles? No. You don't, have, you don't have any faith in No, that. I think it's the wrong word to use. Science can't explain everything. Atheism isn't there to give you answers. It's like we said earlier, it's kind of like a default position. It's okay. not saying this okay. is how the world works. Mm. It's use what you got and let's figure it out from there. We're not making things up though to try to fill in stuff we hope mm. is true. So you don't have faith that someday science will be able to explain away life from non-life or consciousness. It might you in some cases. So you believe it'll happen, but you just don't like the word faith. No, no, no. That, I, it, maybe it could. Here's, here's maybe where I would see it. You, you don't necessarily say that science will explain that, but you, is it fair to say that you, you, you are confident that whatever the explanation is, it's a purely natural explanation? Not, yes, I have con Yes, I would say it's purely yeah. natural explanation. Now, is, is that if, an article of faith? If we could figure it out, if we could figure it yeah. out, I have faith that science is the best tool we right. have to find it. Now, so if now, that's how is, you want to define it. Is your it, belief that, say, the origin of the universe or the origin of life is purely natural, nothing to do with God or any supernatural element, is that, is that an article of faith, in a sense? Is I don't that, think I have to... I'm not putting anything on the line to say that there's a natural explanation for it, even if I don't know what it is yet. It's just saying, okay, based on all the evidence I have in front of me, where nothing supernatural is happening, then I'm pretty sure that's going to work the same way. It's not taken, this isn't the king going in that wheelbarrow. Okay. This is just saying like, yeah, it seems yeah. like that's what's going to happen, but I'm not staking much on that claim right there. We, we, that was fascinating stuff. We'll try and get to one last question. I think this may have to be the last one tonight. Big bad. R. Yeah, I know. Um, 
Okay, here we go. <laughs> Don't worry, that's what internet comment threads were made for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can keep this we, going forever. We, we, kind of, we kind of touched on this earlier, but I think it's a good one to finish with. Um, what can either of you imagine would cause you to doubt your faith or atheism? Uh, maybe start with you, Sean. What, what would cause you to doubt your faith? You know, psychologically, if something horrible happened to my wife or my kids, I mean, I think I'd be fooling myself if, that didn't, if I didn't say that might make me doubt and question God. I don't know if that would make me give up my belief, but that might make me doubt. Look, the reality is I doubt my faith all the time. <laughs> I live in doubt. I doubt everything. It's the way I'm wired. If I didn't doubt, I wouldn't write books and do research. It's just the way I'm put together. So I do doubt things. I think what would cause me to give up my faith is if I thought, number one, the resurrection was explained away. The heart of the Christian faith is the resurrection. And I find the evidence for that compelling. So if they found the body of Jesus, I would give up my faith. <laughs> I think and, I would and, have and to. And Paul said he would as well. St. Paul, you know. 1 Corinthians said... 15, 14, he would. Um, so in that sense, yes, it's entirely possible if, if that happened, then you, you would give up your faith. Because ultimately, Christianity for you is, is based in a set of historical facts, which if it was shown to be false, you'd have to give it up in that if sense. If you were intellectually yeah. honest, I think you would have to give it up. Now, how they would actually show that that's the body of Jesus it's is a question. separate thing. But in yeah. principle, if they did, Paul says Christianity's done. So if they found the body or better explained away the resurrection, I think I'd be dishonest not to. So coming to you, Heman, is there anything that would make you doubt, or do you ever doubt your, your atheism? Do you ever have- If I'm being honest with you, no. I don't doubt it anymore. There's nothing that shakes my lack of faith. Okay. Uh, and it's the answer I would give to the question too. Show me the evidence and I'll change my mind. I'm not convinced by the things people think are evidence that they've thrown my way. But hey, yeah, show it to me. I, I would hope I would change my mind based on the evidence. Otherwise, what am I doing? What are you doing here, if you're not willing to be open, at least, to, right. to having this kind of... Can we have a round of applause for both Hemant and Sean? Thank you. Thank you.